The hour of five o'clock having arrived, I'd like to call to order the uh, regular meeting of the Palisades Water District. And um, Natalie Clark, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Very good. And uh, Director Ellitharp and Director Pinnock are not with us. Uh, additions to the agenda. Do we have any additions? No, the, no additions, sir. Very good. The adoption may entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for July 19th. So moved. And a second? Seconded. Uh, please vote. Un unanimous. Very good. Uh, do we have any public speakers? We do not. Very fine. Presentations. Uh, North County Water Agency fourth grade calendar contest. Yes, uh, if I'll start off before I kick it off to Chris. So this is our annual fourth grade calendar, calendar contest, and we're very excited to have several of the winners here today. So Chris, if you'd like to take over from there. Thank you so much, Assistant General Manager. Uh, so today we have our presentation of awards for our annual poster contest. Um, poster contest has been going on since like 1993, so a long time. And the poster contest in turn turns into a calendar that will be produced in uh, 2024. So uh, the students' artwork um, with uh, Balacitos' work will be included in a specific month. And I think we only have our first place winner today, uh, a couple of the other um, winners. Uh, I think are on vacation, you know, they might be a little further further away than we expected and uh, I'll see if I can get them to come to a, a board meeting at a future event. But our first place winner, with the artwork up there, both on your uh, screen and in the lobby is uh, Natalie Clark. Natalie, congratulations. Part of your award is a $100 gift certificate to awesome. Amazon. So you get to go shopping a little bit. So I'd really like to get a picture of, of Natalie with uh, board members in the um, bullpen here. So Natalie, I'll be sure to get some additional um, calendars to you to give out during the holidays. That'll be your chance to give those to family and friends for holiday events. And I certainly appreciate your artwork and can't wait to see your artwork in the calendar. <laughs> Very good. Natalie, continue to paint. This is excellent, an excellent job. All right, very good. Uh, next presentation. Yes, yeah, so the next presentation is the award of our scholarship. So I know that the uh, P3 committee worked hard on the, both the process and the recommendation, and the board went ahead and approved it. And today is the day that we finally get to award our scholarships. Chris? So we do have our uh, scholarship students here today. We've got five of the actual six. Brooke Sinella couldn't make it. She's on vacation. But we do have the students here, and we will be able to actually put these checks in their hand. I'm going to call them up one at a time to the podium. And first off is Evan Fox, who was an intern here 
uh, during the spring semester. So, Evan? Well, congratulations. Thank you. And board members, I, Evan is the, was the intern that was here during the spring, and a, there's been some no chances to really interact with our intern, so feel free to uh, grill him or quiz him about <laughs> the, uh, his time here as an intern. Well, how long was your time as an intern? Uh, six months, about. Six yeah. months. Mm -hmm. uh, in the field? Uh, in the field, in the office, all around the, the building, everywhere. Perfect, yeah. perfect. And I understand you may have an opportunity uh, at the Water Authority? Yeah, I just uh, did the pre-employment process for the Water Authority internship. Very good. Yep. Excellent. Well, it's a great uh, industry to get involved with. Congratulations. Thank you. What part did you like the best? What um, rotation did you like the best? Hmm, I think I liked the pumps and motors and maintenance a lot, okay. as well as um, water distribution and uh, at the MRF treatment plant. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, that was really cool. Very good. So, so Evan, you're telling me you didn't, you didn't enjoy meeting with the GM and the AGM <laughs> Oh, I forgot about that. It was, it was the first part. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm hearing that as a common thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, congratulations, Evan. Thank you, thank you. Here's your actual check. And don't go anywhere because I need a photo. Okay. Uh, second uh, $1,000 scholarship winner is Caitlin Hansen. Um, I mean, a little bit about me. I was interning at the city of Carlsbad um, with their water district for about six months. Um, I just got a full-time position over in their sustainability department. So, but I'm, I'm hoping to return to water soon. I have my D2 on Saturday. Uh -oh, so, perfect. wish me luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm also a resident of San Marcos. So oh, there you go. This is my, I am a rate payer <laughs> as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I appreciate it. Stay for fun. Yes. Are we supposed to be doing these? Yeah, are we supposed to be doing these? That's my bad. Okay. Okay, let's, I'll wait. start it off. Evan Fox. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez, I forgot. Evan. Oh. Caitlin Hansen. Hey. hey. Okay. Now we got the, now we're ready. <laughs> All right, third one, Daniel Baza. Oh, hey. There we go. Hello. Um, so thank you for uh, uh, letting me be here. Um, yeah, I uh, trying to you know do a career in the water industry. Uh, I recently passed my D two exam. Congrats. Oh, good. Good. So, um, yeah, I'm just looking forward forward to. Uh, the future in the career in the water industry. Well, terrific. Good for you. Thank you. And Thank where you. do you live? I live in Escondido. Ah, terrific. Uh -huh. You're a student at Palomar? Yes. Okay. And uh, I'm going to intern at the uh, San Diego Water Authority also. As well. oh, oh, good. Okay, good. Very good. All right. Dan, here's your check. Don't go anywhere. Uh, next is Juliana Stifka Kellesa. Hi, thank you for your time and consideration for my application. I really appreciate it. I hope in the future maybe to work with GIS and, yeah, with the water district. So, thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Remind uh, us where you're going to school. Um, I go to Cal State San Marcos mm -hmm. and I also go to Palomar. So oh, to terrific. Thank you. My alma mater. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Congratulations. Okay, and last but not least is Flavia Orium, and Flavia is going to be our intern in the fall. Oh, so terrific. she'll be starting in just a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks internship oh. starts. Right? <laughs> I didn't hear you. That's okay. But um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I look forward for my internship in August. Very much. Yeah, Excited. Congratulations. Thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. Remind thank you us so where much. you're going to school again. I'm at Palomar. You're right? at Palomar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Awesome. Terrific. And where do you live? I live um, down San Diego, like down south. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Well, very good. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are we going to come down, yep. Chris? I wanted to let um, Jacob uh, Sheba from Palomar College is here. He oh. is the water and wastewater coordinator for Palomar College. Oh. A lot of these are his students, right? Uh, yeah, four out of the five right here. Right? Perfect. Um, so again, my name is Jacob Sheba. I'm the program coordinator for water technology at Palomar College. I've uh, been there for about four years now. I just wanted to formally thank all of you guys uh, for your support, uh, working with Chris, working with Director Boyd Hodginson on getting this internship started. And we've now had the three, we're going on our fourth intern. Uh, your support for our local students providing scholarships, which can, which can be life-changing. So I just wanted to thank all of you, uh, board of directors and staff. Uh, we just really appreciate your support and the partnership that we've got here at Palomar College, and we look forward to future endeavors. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank and you. congrats to you all. Okay, now we're ready. The one in your hand is worth more. <laughs> yeah, this one you can't take it anywhere. Yeah. No, but I need all of all of the scholarship students to kind of squeeze in around this big one thousand dollars scholarship check. Come on in, board on members. In. Oh yeah, there um, we go. Go for it. Oh well, wait, let me make sure they're lined up okay. I hate to do that. We're off. We're off center. We're off center. Yeah. So we need like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Director Rosette, come, come forward. There we go. That's getting better. That's looking a lot more easier. Okay. okay. with the students and see if they want individual pictures sure. of the check that I can send to them. And uh, Thank you. board members, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for coordinating this. This is one of the more feel-good meetings that we have. Yes. <laughs> and next we have new hires, James. Yes, uh, thank you, President Hernandez. Uh, so as the board may recall that uh, quarterly we bring new hires and achievements to the board. And, and this quarter, which started on April 1st and ran through June 30th, I have a fairly long list. We actually have three new hires, but a, a vast number of accomplishments that were achieved by our very own employees. So bear with me as I'm going to go through the list, but okay. starting with the new hires. Our three new hires included uh, Luis Bustamante, which started as a construction worker one. Uh, he's not here today, unfortunately. He was out at a main break until 1 a.m. today. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. 5 a.m. 5 a.m.? This is when we got the water. Uh, okay, 1 a.m. we got the water. Well, he was out till 5 a.m. So obviously he is resting, well-deserved rest at home. Uh, Rosa Marcello is our county technician. And she took over for our main payroll person, so that's a very important position to the district, as because everybody wants to get their paychecks, that's obviously. Right. Sure. That's right. And uh, last but not least, Denise Aviles is our human resource and risk manager, and we got her from South Coast Water District. And Denise is here. We used to say hi really quick. So, hi. Welcome, Denise. Welcome aboard. So as far as achievements, uh, we have a number of achievements, and I want to start out with our own very own Ed Pedrazzi, who was awarded the Excellence in Water Leadership Award and Building a World yeah. Cup. Yeah. And this, this, was, this was a statewide award that he won. So. Wow, congratulations. Um, Trevor uh, Partain was promoted to Water Systems Operator 1. Good. So, uh, Chris Deering received his distribution two for, uh, for uh, basically from the um, uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board, basically st State Water Resource Quality Control Board, okay. the whole thing. Congratulations. So, 
Uh, Allison Fretwell, Allison is, yeah, there she is, she's right there. She actually had a couple of accomplishments. She uh, passed her exam and now she's a QSP, which is a Qualified Stormwater Pollution Provision Plan Practitioner. Oh, oh wow. excellent. And she, uh, she also passed her, uh, basically her Certified Inspection for Sediment and Erosion Control exam. So she is uh, taking tests and passing them left and right. So it's oh, good to see you, Allison. Jesse Legray passed his water distribution two exam. Um, <laughs> Buddy Howe passed his water distribution three exam. Wow. I have a couple more, and, and these are these are big ones also. Nico Salvaggio, did I say that right? Close, Close enough. Okay. Uh, took first place in the wheelbarrow race at the MSA <laughs> and APWA <laughs> rodeo competition. <laughs> and then to go along with that. Ryan Kincaid took third place at the same event on the mini excavator competition. So that continues Valcito's winning record at the rodeo event for the um, MSA and APWA competition. Oh, all right. Congratulations to all of them. So we will expect them to wear something around their necks, just like we've well, seen you do. It, it, it wasn't. Next it, meeting. It, it, <laughs> uh, it wasn't a first place medal at the uh, mini micro try. <laughs> So, all oh, right, those, those, those conclude the, uh, the new hires and achievements. Congratulations. Very good. The uh, consent calendar, uh, does anyone wish to pull anything from the consent calendar? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Seconded. And please vote. And it was unanimous. Very good. Uh, next item is public hearing. This is the place and time for a hearing to consider adoption of a resolution of the Alicetus Water District approving the sewer service fee to be collected on the tax rolls for Improvement District A for the fiscal year July 1, 2023 to June 30, 2024. Notice of the public hearing was published in the Union Tribune on July 3rd and July 10th. The public hearing is now open. Uh, Assistant Manager James Compel, will you please provide the details? Yes, uh, President Hernandez. So this hearing, the purpose of this hearing is to get input on the sewer service fees that are collected for what we call Improvement District A, or sewer only customers. Uh, this is an annual uh, process that the district goes through, and you may recall at a previous meeting we set the time of the public hearing, which is not here today. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand this over to our Chief Financial Officer, Wes Hall. Very good. Good evening, President Hernandez, members of the board. Um, this is an annual item, as uh, Assistant General Manager Gumpel mentioned, uh, and it's a continuation of the June 7th meeting. Uh, don't typically do a presentation on this, but Mike was kind enough to put something together for me, so we got a short two-page presentation. Uh, <clears throat> so this, at the last meeting on June 7th, uh, we actually approved the collection, so we elected to collect these fees on the tax roll, and it's for uh, districts where we don't, we have sewer service, but we don't have water service, like VID and Rincon. Um, and this meeting is actually set to public hearing, so we now have the numbers, and this is going to be to send it out for collection. So right now we've already approved the resolution to, we elected to do it, now we're just going to collect those fees, and the fees are approximately 2,100 parcels, and the total will be $1,066,000. Uh, and this next slide shows the summary of what we've done, which we elected on June 7th, and now we're holding the public hearing, which is right now, and adopting the resolution to approve the collection of the, those fees on the sewer tax roll, on the sewer fees. And that's it. It's a oh, recommendation is just to approve the resolution. I have a, I have a question. question. Yep. <clears throat> Would you mind reiterating, because I, I think this is a good story to tell, why we do this for these particular customers, mm -hmm. how much it costs, and how much it saves our district money? It actually would save quite a bit with the admin costs, and it only costs us about $0.10 cents per parcel. So we're talking about what? About $2,100? No, twenty. $210 a year to do this, uh, whereas we're avoiding all the admin fees. But we don't really, uh, since we only have the sewer service, we don't have the water service, if the customers were not to pay their bill, we wouldn't have any repercussions. So we wouldn't have any way to shut off the water because they're a water service customer of a different district. So this just saves us that collection and any hassle of having to go after and try to get the money later on. 
and it doesn't cost a whole lot. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions from the board? Uh, do we have any questions from the public regarding we, this item? Oh, we should just officially open the public hearing. And, oh. And then if you've um, got, <clears throat> I did say it. I missed it. I'd like to open the public hearing then. Do we have any public that wants to have a question? All right. Very good. Uh, Assistant General Manager Compel, did you receive any written notice of the public? <coughs> no, we did not. Very good. And then I think I would like to close the public hearing. There being no person wishing to address the board, uh, does any of the board member wish to move adoption of the Board of Directors Water District approval of collection of the fees on the tax rolls? I will move as stated. And second? Second. Very good. Now we're going to vote. And it was unanimous. <clears throat> All right. Moving on to action items. Uh, action item 3.1 regarding Velocitas investment report. Uh, just a quick uh, intro before I hand this over to us also. Uh, so as the board may recall, uh, we're going through a process. We had Chandler Asset Management come and do a presentation. This w presentation today is really two different items. One is just to go over our existing um, uh, investment report that is located monthly in our board memos uh, that goes out uh, is it the first or second meeting typically? It's usually the first if we're able to get in yep. since the month is over. And then also uh, Wes is going to go over what our staff manage investments look like and how we do that and what we've done in the last basic uh, month or so with our staff manage uh, investment portfolio. So with that, Wes. Thank you. Um, good evening again. Um, this presentation hopefully should be a little little more exciting because we get to talk about investments and return and making money. So, you know, with a special occasion, I created a party page just for the investment report for tonight for this occasion. And now that we've seen that, we're all excited we can get into the agenda. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to check with Jonathan real quick. Do, do we have our guest speaker? Is she available to present? I'm going to do it at the end, but I just want to make sure she's available. Uh, she is. Here. Okay. Yeah, she's on right now. I can allow her to talk whenever you're ready. Okay, so it'll be at the end. I'll introduce her, but thank you. So the agenda for this presentation, first I'm going to go into the background, so we're going to talk about the investment report, why we prepare it, and what its contents are. Then we'll talk about some of the contents, and in the report we have details of transactions. We have the diversification or the uh, investment balances of the portfolio. <clears throat> and we have the weighted average to maturity of the district's portfolio compared to other portfolios. We have the district's portfolio yield. And then just for some information, uh, after that, I'm going to talk about some historical yields and comparing to those same portfolios. And finally, we'll go into the California Asset Management Program, or CAMP, and we'll have a guest speaker on that item. So starting off, the district's investments since about 2018 have been divided into two uh, components. The first of those two components is our internally managed funds. Those are our liquid funds. So we are required to keep six months of operating expenses in liquid funds so that we can fund those expenses. We're also required to keep our budgeted CIP for the fiscal year and our debt service payments for the fiscal year in liquid managed funds. And we have two different sort of savings accounts or pools currently that we're investing in. We're adding a third to that, as, and I'll show that, and I'll speak about that in the presentation. The other component to the district's investments are our externally managed funds, and those are our portfolio investments that are managed by Chandler Asset Management, and they were here at the last meeting to talk about their strategies and their results. So the investment reports, why do we prepare them? Well, the investment policy in section 13.3 says that we will prepare a report of transactions on a monthly basis to be submitted to the board within 30 days after the end of the period, and that's in accordance with California Government Code section 53607. Uh, and our report contents to satisfy that government requirement are it has to have our transactions, our investment balances, our weighted average, our yield, and then finally a one-page summary and detailed holdings of our investments. So the next slide shows is actually in the investment report that's in your board packet for this month. This is, these are the transactions for the month of June. This is, these are all of the transactions that hit our portfolio, and you can see in total the portfolio balance changed by $4.2 million during the month. Now, most of the transactions are maturities or sales of investments, but we can see there are also three purchases in here that I wanted to point out. 
we have the three purses circled in red. Uh, two of them are agencies, and one's a corporate note at the bottom. The two agencies at the top for about a million dollars. The par would be a million dollars. They were purchased at a discount. Um, keep in mind, all of these investments were purchased by Chandler because this is their um, part of the portfolio. And the three investments were purchased at a return of between 3.2 and 3.75%. And their duration is almost is approximately five years for the three. So there's more of a long-term look on those investments. And that's actually towards the maximum amount that we can invest in. It usually goes anywhere from zero to five years maximum on the portfolio. And then also noteworthy at the bottom of the transaction, as you can see, June 30th, we were able to open an account with the California Asset Management Program and invest or deposit $4.3 million into that program. And the yield of that right now is 5.24%, or I should say the yield June 30th was 524 It's gone up since then, and we'll talk more about that later. So those are the transactions. The next section of the investment report is our diversification or our investment balances. And this shows all the investments that we have in our portfolio. And Quick in question. Sure. If you don't mind. <clears throat> um, going back to your slide one ago about the three larger purchases they made, that was post the meeting when they came in here? Um, it may have. It was June 7th, and they purchased those. Hold on, let me go back. I think they were. Yeah, all three of them were. For a, mi a million dollars for th three three percent in. Yep. So the first one was a million at three point seven five on six nine. Then a and million who, dollars. And uh, who Chandler initiated the camp, or did you initiate? We the did camp? the camp. So the camp is part of our internally managed funds, and we're going to talk. That's part of our strategy with a, about half of our portfolio that we keep in uh, liquid. Uh, we're moving funds currently from LAFE to camp, and and the delta between camp and their investments. Yes. Fairly large. Yeah, you and mean you're talking about the, the, the monetary investment. Um, all right, so you're looking at two point five million dollars here invested by Chandler at an average of three point four percent. We'll call it uh, internal investment into Camp five point two four percent. Now five point four four percent. So a difference of two percent. So in two, let's just say two million dollars. Quite a large difference of money. So and the reason for those investments probably being at a lower rate is because they're going out five years. Oh, I understand, yeah. but there's also multi-year treasuries available at fairly favorable rates near that. Yeah, so it's just a matter of strategy whether they want to do it short-term at a higher rate or if they were going to go long-term to lock it in. Yep. It, it looks like, and I can't really speak for them, but it looks like their strategy here is to lock in longer-term at 3.75. So they're, that would tell me they're expecting on the next five years rates to go even lower than 3.75. Uh, question, and the other uh, autos, John Deere, all those, those are vehicles, I suspect? No, are those are actually asset-backed securities. They're just- Oh, they are? Yeah, they're asset-backed securities by John Deere. So they're, ah. they're basically issuances by John Deere. We purchased them as asset-backed securities. Oh, I see, okay. And, and we sold a portion, and we do that every month. That, to me, is just a lot of work. I don't know why we don't just sell them all, because if you look at the rates on those- Yeah, pathetic. Yeah. And, it, and that, again, I'd have to ask Chandler why they're only selling a portion of them versus just getting, like, offloading all of them. Um, do they get a cut with every transaction? He's, they do not. He not, said not no, from us. but it was not a very clear <clears throat> answer in, in the manner in which I, I personally asked that question. I would, I would love to re-ask the question in a different way because there's two ways to kind of answer that. One is he's saying that he's not making on, on fees for investing in, in this, but there are funds for which he could, their firm could be benefiting, the question needs to be asked in a more direct way. And can we direct them to, to liquidate these? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we have contracted them. We're, we're contracting them for their professional services, so they're supposed to be the experts. But I imagine if we called them and said, we want you to get rid of this, this is our portfolio. Uh, what does it take to do that? Probably just a phone call. But it's something that I'd want to look at and talk and want to ask them first because they are the experts i'd say hey why are we doing this and then listen to what they respond and if it makes sense then i wouldn't but otherwise i would say yeah can we just well i would like you to look do that make that phone call because sure. this is ridiculous and yeah. one, you one can pitch pennies yeah, one of the things that we need to look at is uh, i don't know if there was any direction from the board based on the last time the first time when chandler came here but i know that we have a um, we need to circle back to the board with chandler uh, on that subject matter. So we'll have to revisit that, whether through committee and the full board or some through some expedited manner. Okay, 
do that. I, I agree. I think that you know this is a this is a much larger discussion that we need to make sure that all of us are understanding what the what the goals and how it fits with the strategic plan. I would almost suggest that we need to have like a like a financial work shop or something with mm -hmm. them to have a, to explore a larger discussion. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I know Wes is working on with both Glenn and myself is, is working with Chandler coming back, filling in some holes and in information that the board still needs, and then coming back and reporting back to see where, is it, where it is appropriate to bring, whether it goes directly to finance committee, to a workshop, or just right to a workshop with the whole board. At, mm -hmm. at one point, the whole board will need to hear it, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Thank you. Okay, so those are the transactions. The next part of the investment report is our diversification or investment balances. This shows the balances in every type of investment that we have in our portfolio, internal and external. Um, and you can see here that the, by far the largest portion of the portfolio is our LAIF, which is our local agency investment fund. It's a local government investment pool, um, and that's actually where we keep most of our liquid funds. It currently is, I think, at 3.15%. Um, but we've also now got camp and the San Diego County investment pool. We've had the San Diego County investment pool. We just invested in camp at, at over 5%. So the strategy going forward will be to move or shift some of that money from LAIF into camp. So there's a, you know, there's transactions we have to do that are limited to $10 million per day. So we're working through the exercise of transferring those funds into a, a higher rate of return, at least for the meantime, on the short-term investments. Beautiful. Well done. And then the weighted average maturity. So this shows the weighted average maturity of our portfolio over the last two years versus agencies such as the Water Authority and other uh, investment pools, such as LAIF and the County Investment Pool. And you can see that the district has a weighted average maturity of 252 days in total, the total portfolio. But without LAIF, we're at 648 days. So that just kind of speaks to the, the Chandler's investment strategy. It's a little bit more long term. So they're almost at a two-year maturity on the portfolio versus 252 being less than a year. <coughs> <clears throat> and then the yield, so this is the last part of the investment uh, report, and we can see over the last two years our yield compared to those other agencies, and by far the highest returning investment right now would be the 90-day treasury, uh, that's at 5.16%. Um, our portfolio is currently returning in total 2.67%. While well, it is the lowest, it's not quite as bad as it looks because we're only, I think the County, was it LAIF is at 3.15 and the Water Authority is only at 3%. So it's not like we're leaps and bounds below those, you know, other investment pools or, or agencies. Um, but we are the lowest, which we don't want to have to say about our yield. Um, but then another, one more slide on yield. So this is just some information. This is 20 years of our yield compared to those same agencies and pools. Um, and really, I know it's, it's kind of a lot of information, one, but the point here is to show the trend line and how we're actually following that. So you can see government agencies who are restricted by government code, we're all right there in the same line. All of us peaked in 2007 at about 5%, and that's actually our 20-year high for investing at 5.12%. Um, and it's also worth noting that over the 20 years, our pool has actually, on average, performed better than all the rest except for the Water Authority. So we've outperformed them. Right now we're not, but again, we're working on a strategy with Chandler and internally to in increase that yield. So, uh, and one of the quick things we're doing- question on this. What, yeah. what year was Chandler brought on? 2018. So it was five years ago in 2018. So we can narrow down the, uh, you know, the charts on that too and see how they've been performing. It's a discussion we'll have with Chandler, especially based on you know, recent events and presentations and conversations. Um, but one of the things that we are doing internally to improve our yield, I've mentioned, is the California Asset Management Program. And very exciting today because we have a guest speaker. This is actually the person that we coordinated with to get us involved in camp. Um, I believe it was one of the directors. I'm not sure who, so I don't want to name any names. But someone went to a, a conference and came back with contact information. We contacted Leslie, and she was happy to give us information and get us set up in the program. So we're able to get this yield. So she's our guest speaker tonight, I believe, to give, uh, give us more information on camp and tell us how it's going to benefit the district. If there are no other questions, I'll pass it on to her. Very good. I think it was Pinnock. It, was, yeah. it probably was. Mm -hmm. he, had like, he had two or three that he mm -hmm. sent to me, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Leslie, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, yes we can. I need to stop sharing. Oh, great. There. 
Great. Well, thank you all for making time for me tonight. And what a great meeting to be a part of. Lots of great things happening at the Water District. Art awards, other sort of awards, commendations, new hires, scholarships. So hopefully we'll continue that trend with some higher earnings. Um, West, are you able to share the presentation that I sent or should I try to share my screen? If you want to try to share yours, it might be easier so you can navigate, but otherwise I can pull it up. I do have it available. Okay, looks like I'm being promoted to a... I'm not, oh wait, here we go, share screen. There we go. Okay, can we see it? Perfect. All right. Well, a little bit um, about CAMP. It is short for the California Asset Management Program. Now, CAMP itself um, is a joint powers authority. It was formed here in California in 1989 uh, for the exclusive use of public agency investors who were looking for economies of scale and professional investment management services at a low cost. I work for a firm called PFM Asset Management, and we are a service provider to the CAMP program. We are the program administrator and investment advisor. Now, we've been working with CAMP since 1989, but we do serve at the pleasure of the board, um, just like the other service providers associated with the program. Um, a little bit about PFM, we have been managing public agency funds since 1980 and again here in California since 1989. We do have very extensive experience in managing local government investment pools like CAMP across the country. We manage about 18 um, local government investment pools ref representing about $50 billion in assets. So the CAMP program itself is made up of two components. Uh, the short-term camp pool, which we'll talk about first, and a new product offering that we're calling camp term. Um, so the camp pool, which the district is invested in, again, is part of those internally managed funds that Wes was talking about earlier. The camp pool is a fully liquid investment options. It's really designed to allow you full access to your funds at all times. It is managed to maintain that stable $1 net asset value. So any dollar that you deposit with us is yours. You can withdraw that dollar at any time plus interest. It's managed again to maintain the safety uh, first and foremost of that principal dollar that you invested with us. But in the meantime, while that dollar is invested, it's gonna be pooled with over $15 billion of other agencies funds. That's our asset level now that could change but about $15 billion um, of funds from other public agencies throughout the state designed to allow you to earn a little bit more interest in the camp pool than you could potentially earn on your own. So a little bit more information about the camp pool. It is rated triple AM by Standard & Poor's. So that is an external nationally recognized rating agencies that looks at our holdings, they look at our transactions and we have to meet very specific criteria to maintain uh, the highest rating that they assign, which is that AAAM rating. We do offer same day liquidity. We want the funds to be available to you to use as you need them. Again, they're your funds. So they are available for same day use as long as you let us know by 11 a.m. We don't have any um, transaction limits in terms of the number of transactions or the dollar amount of transactions that you can do with the CAMP program. We have an online portal, the ability to open uh, multiple sub accounts, and there are no minimum investments um, amounts nor minimum transactions amounts. Interest is paid out monthly and there are no additional out of pocket expenses. So the rates that you see quoted from us are actually the rates that you're earning. To kind of compare and contrast LAIF um, with CAMP, which is our program, We've included this next slide. Um, a lot of public agency investors here in California certainly do use LAY for a large portion of their liquid funds. So we find it's helpful to sort of compare and contrast our program offering, which is CAMP versus LAIF. 
Um, CAMP values that net asset value every single day. Again, that's another step that we take to make sure that we can maintain that liquidity because again, the funds are yours. We want them to be available to you um, when you need them. Our program is AAAM rated by Standard & Poor's, whereas LAFE is not rated. The weighted average maturity, which I know Wes talked about the weighted average maturity of um, your funds managed by Chandler, the weighted average maturity of the camp pool is relatively short at 28 days compared to LAFE's weighted average maturity at the time this report was printed at 268 days. So it's a little bit in the weeds, but this is an important consideration uh, because in a rising interest rate environment, which we've largely been in for the past year or year and a half, the securities in the underlying camp portfolio are going to turn over faster than the securities in the LAFE pool. So that means in a rising rate environment, we're going to be able to rotate out of those older, lower yielding securities and purchase newer, higher yielding securities at a faster pace than LAFE, which really explains in large part why we're able to um, offer a nice yield advantage relative to LAFE now. And I did tell Wes before in some of our conversations, and certainly it's something we tell all of our clients, you don't necessarily want to close out of your LAFE account. You want to keep it open as an option to you, but we think that CAMP is a great complement to LAFE because they'll perform differently in different interest rate environments. So you want to diversify your short-term holdings so that you're able to capitalize on different rate environments and put your money where it's going to earn the most. So right now in a rising interest rate environment, you might want to switch that balance, move funds from LAFE over to CAMP to take advantage of our yield offering, which is higher, but you want to keep that LAFE account open and keep an eye on it in case the market conditions ever change and you want to switch the balance and put a little bit more money back um, into LAFE at the expense of CAMP. Leslie, I have um, a question. One, is sure. that something that your, that your um, asset management company provides is sort of the, the analyses to show when it's optimal to bounce back and forth between the CAMP and the LAFE? Or is that something that you would do? Or just how I'm trying to, I, I understand the benefit of moving mm -hmm. back and forth. I'm just trying to figure out who, who would be in charge of doing that analysis and figuring it out so we could stay ahead of it? That's yes. a great question. Um, we are limited in terms of what we can put on a page comparing one to the other because we can't verify specifically LAFE's um, calculations. But typically, that might be included in a, in a monthly treasurer's report. You could include the month-end yields from both programs. And I'm always happy to hop on a call with Wes to sort of chat about what we're, where LAFE is quoted, where PF, where CAMP is quoted their yields and kind of what we're thinking about in terms of where rates, rates might move in the future. All right, continue. Great, good question. Um, another kind of difference between the two is CAMP pays out interest monthly versus LAFE, which pays out quarterly. So you're going to earn your, in your interest is going to earn interest a little bit faster in the CAMP program. Taking a look at the characteristics of the camp pool, this is as of April 30th, but we do um, update this data. It should be available online soon as of June 30th. Uh, but the sector composition is shown in the bottom left, the credit quality in the bottom right, very highly credit worthy. Um, we are, as a California Joint Powers Agency, um, investing California public agency funds, we are also beholden to California government code investment guidelines, just as you are as an individual public agency. So we're required by code to maintain very safe and highly liquid investments. And that AAAM rating by Standard & Poor's, they also look at our investments. Um, so we want to make sure that everything in the portfolio is very, very highly credit worthy. Total fund net assets were about 15.3 billion as of the end of April. Right now, I think we're up to about 15.8 billion. Uh, the seven day yield as of the end of April was at a 501. As of today, it is at a 526. So that's kind of what we had in terms of general information about the camp pool. The next component I wanted to just touch briefly on in cases of interest um, in the future is our newest program offering called Camp Term. 
So camp term is really designed for funds that aren't going to be needed the next day or aren't going to be needed in the near term. The way that camp term works is that um, you'll work with us as the investment advisor. You'll select a maturity. So let's say you have funds going out the door to meet a debt service payment, for example. You'll know, you know those happen every six months. If you want to invest those funds at a known rate of return rather than leaving them in the fully liquid camp pool with a variable rate, uh, the camp term might be a good option for you. Uh, the investment time periods for camp term range between uh, 60 days to one year. You will know the rate of investment at the day that you make the investment and interest is paid out at maturity. It's linked up to your camp pool account so you send your cash over to the camp pool. If you say, yes, I want to do a three-month camp term obligation, we'd take the funds out of the camp pool option, use it to purchase the term at maturity. They flow back into the camp pool so that they're always invested and you're always earning that interest. Um, there's customization, which a lot of folks seem to like um, with the camp program, with the camp term program, because you can select the maturities that work for you. Um, camp term is also rated triple uh, A. Specifically, it's rated triple A F by Fitch Securities. Um, it's ideal for known revenue and expenditure streams. The minimum investment amount is $1 million per maturity. And again, maturities range between 60 days and one year. So between the fully liquid camp pool option and the camp term option, which can be laddered out at known rates of return, for anywhere between um, 60 days to a year, we think we have a pretty good full scale off offering for fully liquid funds and funds that need to um, remain invested for a year or less. A little bit about uh, the camp pool and kind of what we offer. We do offer online um, reporting. We offer online transaction ability and our program is secure and we do offer multi-factor authentication. As I mentioned earlier, um, the CAMP program itself is a joint powers authority and it is managed by a board of directors. So what we're showing on this next slide um, is a listing of the current board of directors of the CAMP pool. You see we try to have a wide um, representation of various um, public agency, finance, business, and other um, public finance leaders all throughout the state. In addition to PFM as the program administrator and investment advisor, uh, US Bank serves as the custodian. And we've also listed out the auditor and the legal counsel um, who also serves the camp board. And that, other than the disclaimers, uh, brings me to the end of my prepared comments. I will just end by saying we appreciate um, the district support of the camp program. Um, Wes has made a couple of transactions and we're looking forward to continuing um, to work with you all as you continue to evaluate and maximize your short-term investment options. Yes, Eric. Thank you for the presentation, appreciate it, um, and uh, excited to go to camp. I'm just curious, is the only way to go to camp through you? It is. So PFM, we are the distributor of the camp program. Thank you, and timely for summer puns, so appreciate Exactly. It. I have a question. Yes. Can you talk a little bit? Can you talk a little bit about your board makeup? Can you switch back to that slide and talk a little bit about your board makeup? Yes, absolutely. So some of these board members are very long tenured, long serving members of the board. I'm thinking Karen Adams from Merced County has been a member of the board for many, many years. Uh, but we do try to get a good representation of individuals from Northern California versus Southern California. Uh, we have some folks from schools, Council of Governments, a few folks kind of in your, your neck of the woods in Southern California and various cities and counties. Right now, um, the Water District is a, an investor in the CAMP program. If there was ever any interest in someone from the district serving on the CAMP board, um, you could kind of up, change, do some, change some of the paperwork that we have on file, adopt a resolution to officially join the JPA, and then the district itself would be eligible 
uh, for membership on the board and able to vote in, in board-related matters. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what your company does to try to attract a diverse workforce and a diverse board? That's a good question, and that's certainly that's something that's coming to the forefront uh, more and more these days. Um, we do try to have diverse representation and diversity of thought and ideas um, represented on our board. And that's something that is a, um, a push in our company as well. At PFM Asset Management, we have various um, SRGs, which are um, groups within PFM, now part of U.S. Bank, um, looking to really make sure it's a, a welcoming and inclusive place for people of all different types of backgrounds. And that's something that's taken into consideration in hiring decisions as well. Okay, uh, one other question. Um, should we reconsider our relationship with Chandler? Would you be throwing your hat in the ring for a uh, replacement? Absolutely, we would love to. Um, we have been managing separately managed accounts here in California for uh, just about as long as we've been managing the camp program, which was 1989. Um, we manage, I think in total, about $66 billion between assets under management and assets under advisement just here in California. So we would love to um, provide any support that you might need, even if it's just some oversight or another set of eyes, or if you do decide to consider your relationship there, we'd love to put our name in the hat. Appreciate that. And how do you personally feel about our returns? Well, I can certainly see why you are asking the questions. Um, I think your current advisor would be in the best position to answer those, but I think that you're asking the right questions, and I think there needs to sort of be an open dialogue between kind of that push-pull of the fact that we are in an inverted yield curve environment, yet your, your desire to earn as much money as is prudently safe and appropriate on your funds. Thank you. That was a very diplomatic answer, Leslie. <laughs> yeah. Anything further? Is that the end of your presentation, Leslie? That brings us to the end. Well, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation, very uh, informative. And thank you to the board. This was just an informational item at this time. Very good. All right. Moving on. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Do you have another slide? Or? Nope, I'm good. Uh, James, did we bring up the AAA thing, by the way? I don't know. We bring it up. That's all right. We can't forget that. I won't forget. All right. Moving on to item 3.2, award of professional service agreement for contract project management services for the land outfall parallel section A. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, one part of a much larger project, and I want to take a little bit of a time while staff is getting set up with their presentation. So the land outfall project, at essence, is really just a pipeline. It's a pipeline between the Alcius Water District and the, uh, the Encina plant. Uh, but it's really our main artery of bringing uh, sewer that's generated at our district to Encina and all the solid waste that is removed from the, the separated from the water for recycled water at Meadowlark to Encina because they treat 100% of our solid waste. The project itself, even though it essentially is a pipeline, is actually a fairly large project. And with the corridor, the environmental constraints, and the uh, government interactions uh, associated, it's really one opportunity to do this project. And, and for uh, like Director Hernandez, who's heard about the land outfall since before he even joined the board, yeah. he knows that this project was eminent prior to the recession. Uh, recession, water use restrictions, uh, managing our treatment plan, the way we uh, uh, balance flows, have all allowed us to uh, basically uh, extend the life of the existing outfall. But you'll hear from the presentation that the time is now, as now with the rain events and the growth in our area, that sewer spills are more prominent and regular um, among the line outfall. Just a brief description, and before I hand it over to engineering to talk a little bit more about it, this pipe has been in existence for going on four plus decades now. Uh, and it never intended to operate with the type of growth that we've seen in our area, and obviously won't be able to accommodate the future growth. 
so the moving forward in this project is, is, is large, and I, I don't know the total price tag of everything, but there are really, in my mind, uh, there's several projects divided up. It's been studied extensively in the master plan, and on our, on our programmatic EIR within the 2008 and the 2018 master plan, we actually did it at a project level because we knew the importance of this project. So uh, it's something that has basically been discussed since pre-2008 and obviously continues to be studied. With that, there's two main sections, what we call the land outfall west. The land outfall west, which uh, you can see from the figure, is basically not the green, but everything west, basically from El Camino Real all the way to Encina to the coast is actually owned and operated by Valacitos, but there's capacity rights and shared costs with Valacitos, the city of Carlsbad, and Buena Sanitation District. Good news is there's time on that portion of the pipe. It's primarily all gravity lines, and we have capacity. In other words, we can accommodate growth in the agencies. Majority of that pipe, if not all of it, will, it has to be refurbished, enlarged, or replaced. But there's still time for that, and there's times to study it, because at this point, every agency is changing. Water use is changing. The, the landscape of the growth in the area is changing, so we need to restudy that option. Today, and the main thing we're going to talk about today, is what we call the land outfall east, and that's really that green portion, really from our lift station one, which is across from the high school all the way to El Camino Real. The dominant structure of this is what we call a siphon. It's actually a pressurized line. Not a gravity line, but like most sewers. And that in itself is, a, I don't know the exact figures, and oh, Ryan will, yep. Uh, but that in itself is, is a great undertaking. And matter of fact, uh, that's portions of it will need to get upgraded, portions of it will need to get paralleled. So with that, I think I'll hand it over to our engineering team to talk more specific about the land off all east and what we're doing to start moving that project forward. All right, thank you for that introduction, AGM Gumpel. I'm just going to back up on the figure a little bit to start my intro here. <laughs> All right. Um, That's it. Well, anyway, uh, apologies for that. The district's land outfall is the primary artery for wastewater conveyance to Encina Wastewater Authority at the Encina Water Pollution Control Facility, shown on the map. Um, it's approximately eight miles in total, which ranges from 24 inch to 54 inch diameter sewer outfall. It conveys 100% of the solids and the remainder of sewage collected from district service areas which is not treated at our Metal Arc Water Reclamation Facility. As Assistant AGM, Assistant GM Gumpel mentioned, the land outfall west uh, is broken out into ownership, essentially beginning at Encina and ending at El Camino Real. It, it includes a total of about 3.3 miles of land outfall and it has shared capacity ownership with Buena Sanitation District and the city of Carlsbad. Section D is the uh, first section. It's the furthest west reach, which goes into Encina directly. It's 2.6 miles uh, of pipeline, and it is currently planned for uh, replacement capacity improvement. From there, section C is a short section, just about a half a mile that continues towards the east. Again, it's, it's planned for replacement upsize. And then lastly is section B, which is another just uh, small section, 0 0.3 miles of uh, capacity upsize improvements. These are all considered future CIP projects in the, in the current budget. Uh, from this point east, ownership, uh, shared capacity ownership, drops off and it's 100% owned by Valacitos. Sorry for the jumping around. 
Section A in total is 5.1 miles. It includes a uh, lengthy siphon section of about uh, 3.8 miles uh, in total of that siphon. And then the remaining uh, eastern portion of that uh, section A is gravity, fed, it's gravity flow, and it's about 1.3 miles. So in total, 5.1 miles. And really what we're talking about today is the green section, section A, um, and, uh, parallel uh, siphon A and also parallel gravity A improvements. Uh, these are uh, parallel replacements, whereas the further west reaches are replacements. Uh, this is based on prior planning, and staff is going to uh, reevaluate the uh, uh, planning phase of this project, uh, which really dates back, the program dates back to 2007 of or original planning. With conservation, water use restrictions, and the recession, it delayed the immediate need for the capacity, capacity improvements over the last couple decades. The project was delayed for several years, and in most recent years, heavy rain events revealed uh, that the bottleneck in the land outfall still exists, and the low point uh, prone to SSOs is identified on the map where it says right here the laurels. Past SSOs occurred, uh, sanitary sewer overflows or spills occurred in 2020, and two in the last year, uh, this year, uh, with all the heavy atmospheric rivers we experienced. Um, uh, approximately $40 million is currently budgeted between active and future spending between the various land outfall pro program projects, and those are listed on page 162 of your board packet. Uh, staff is currently initiating the planning phase of the land outfall parallel sewer si section A, the green section in front of you, uh, which is, as you can see, the, the largest section of, of them all. Um, additionally, district is going to initiate the design phase of land outfall west repair and rehabilitation project, which is mentioned in the staff report, and that is budgeted for this current fiscal year 23-24. The future projects uh, in the West Reach are going to be reevaluated as part of the land outfall long range planning process over the next several years, uh, over the next several years, several years coming up in CIP. Uh, with this, Capital Facilities is currently managing 23 budgeted active CIP projects that does not include the outfall. Uh, right now, we have $19.5 million in construction budget spending with a total of three full time employees. Uh, the land outfall program requires additional project management resources to supplement existing staff. Uh, capital facilities staff proposed to contract with a program management firm to provide a project manager to, to manage uh, all aspects of the parallel sewer section A project from planning through final design. Uh, this PM will be responsible for advertising the request for proposals for design consultants for parallel section A and manage all uh, planning and design phases of work. The planning study, which will be generated from this effort, will provide an alignment study, CEQA environmental permitting recommendations, and also easement acquisitions and investigations. After planning, district will proceed into the final design phases of this work to actually put together contract documents and go out to construction at a later phase. District staff solicited requests for proposals for staff extension project management services from eight local firms on April 20th, 2023. Two consultants submitted proposals on June 2nd, 2023, including GEI Consultants and Hope Consulting. Staff reviewed uh, the submitted proposals, including project approach, scope, schedule, and determined that GEI was the most qualified and responsive consultant and requested clarification on some scope elements and entered into fee negotiations. Staff received the final version of the scope of work and fee uh, for project management services on June 23rd with a time and materials not to exceed fee of $905,927, which is over a two year contract term. Uh, the GEI team is actually here with us this evening and the uh, selected project manager, Violetta McDaniel, is also here. If the board would uh, like to 
uh, say anything, uh, that is available. For the fiscal impact of land, outfall parallel sewer uh, section A is identified in the current fiscal year 23-24 budget in the amount of $11 million, $360,000. Funding for the project comes uh, from a mix of sewer capacity funds and sewer replacement funds. And this segment of the land outfall is considered to be the eastern portion, uh, which is 100% funded uh, by the district. Uh, the current fiscal year has $250,000 allocated for this project. A total project budget is over $11 million, and the staff estimates that this current fiscal year budget may re require increasing uh, in the future. Staff will bring results of the planning and design RFP uh, later in this fiscal year to the board at a future meeting uh, where we will discuss full um, budgeting and, uh, f and, and funding updates that are, are available. It is with this, the staff recommends the board of directors authorize the general manager to execute a PSA with GEI in the amount of $905,927 for contract project management services for the land outfall parallel sewer section A project. And if there are any questions, I can take those from you at this time. Very good. Do we have any questions? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. With the, the general management coming from your, your firm, and thank you for being here. It's, it's unusual that when we are hearing about a project that's in the works, um, we usually just hear about the, the company that gets the award, so it means a lot that you're here. Um, I keep hearing that there's a lot of money available from the Fed and the state, money for infrastructure projects. And, you know, our, our group is, you know, very, very busy. So I'm wondering, is part of your service, or do you have someone that works on these types of projects with your clients that tries to get that money, that tries to write a grant, or m is making sure that they are on top of what is possibly available? Step up Jerry, to the Jerry, mic. I should know better. <laughs> okay. um, so I'm Jerry Reed with GEI. Um, I, I, we're local here in Carlsbad. That's our office. However, GEI is a full-service firm. And over the last um, five years that I know of, and I've, I've only been there two, but the last five years they've been, you know, uh, obtaining many grants. Uh, Chino Basin, they helped the Inland Empire get grants, uh, WIFI loans, and and state loans for that project. We have a whole team that works on that. They're, they're based in Sacramento. That's our biggest office, and they work with DWR quite a bit. And so they, they're very familiar. And then they actually track the databases of all the, uh, the loans, grants, and, and, and funding available on a monthly basis. The great thing about having uh, Jerry on, and uh, Violette on our team is uh, they're going to do everything we ask to get this project uh, moving forward, get the ball moving forward, and, and, and be really dynamic, uh, depending on the different uh, things that we face. And, and certainly funding is one of them. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, how often do you interact with staff? Um, your staff? Yes. Here. Yeah, so this, Violetta will be the uh, really on-site PM, uh, working on a daily basis with V Violetta is going to have an office space here. She'll um, essentially kind of be extension of staff, extension of staff yep. three days a week roughly um, here, uh, flexible schedule, but she, she'll be moving the ball uh, forward in, in many uh, capacities for this project. Very good. And if there's any uh, questions or concerns, we could always give Jerry a call because even though he's only been at, at GEI for a couple of years, he was the director of engineering at the, the Water Authority. So we have a long-term working relationship from the past. Oh, good. All right. And the, yes, Eric. Um, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And uh, appreciate the background on the project, um, a refresher, I should say, because we've talked about it before. And, and uh, um, and sifting through the proposals and determining a best candidate here. I'm just curious about the price tag. I mean, $905,000, that's a lot of money. And, and considering um, <clears throat> potential for hiring our own internal resources, I mean, you said that three people are managing $19 million of capital projects, and this is an $11 million project, so I'm doing the math, and I go, 900000 wow, that could hire quite a few 
full-time employees here uh, at the district to manage this $11 million project. Um, so curious thoughts on that and was it considered and, and um, why was it not yeah, the I'm best sorry. path forward? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that and, and I'm sure AGM Compel will, will, will round out the answer. So um, it's always been sort of our strategy to uh, minimize uh, our costs as, as much as possible and, and a lot of the uh, investment in employees is, is a real long-term investment, right? We know that that's going to uh, impact our operating budget impacts rates so it's it, we're always kind of conscientious of that so we're always looking for strategies where we can outsource uh, where possible so you're, you're right uh, capital facilities is a team of three which is only two employees right we have a vacant position right now and they're managing about 20 million um, and a lot of that is in the construction so uh, the great thing about bringing um, GEI on is that they've got uh, a lot they bring a lot of expertise to the table um, there's a lot of off-ramps, so in this two-year period, um, there's opportunities to, uh, they're under contract, um, not to, <laughs> we can end their services at any time, not that we would, but there's <laughs> off-ramps, and we'll be evaluating that through the whole period. Is there an opportunity to, to take over more, or is there an opportunity to expand it, or at the conclusion of this, maybe we evaluate that and say, you know what? there really is a financial advantage, not only from just the, the, uh, the cost of the projects, but also looking at all of the projects that that team is managing. And maybe there is an opportunity to bring staff on. Uh, currently, we don't even have a position uh, in the structure to hire someone to do this. So, um, so that's the current route um, that, we're, that we're pursuing. Yeah, and just to round that out, uh, the management had robust discussions on what does long-term outlook look like because even if the staffing cost direct staffing cost is, is going to be less uh, staffing and adding staff is a multi-million dollar decision uh, when you look at the full load of costs over a period of time do we have the workload for that so one of the things that the two drivers on this is we need to get the ball moving because of the existing sewer sanitary sanitary sewer spills and in the existing system right now to hire somebody new, get them up started, uh, project managers level would have to work here a couple years before they were even qualified to manage this type of project. Um, and also, it would take uh, more of Ryan's time than we have the capacity, than he has the capacity to give. Not that he doesn't have the ability, just the capacity with his existing workload. The next thing we have to look at, and the reason why we showed all the projects in its entirety, is we need to really button down the timing of those projects. So as Jason mentioned with the off-ramps, if we realize that we have continual work based on the project timing and our partners' uh, agreements with our partners, because each one of those reimbursements requires separate agreements, and agency-to-agency -agency agreements many times takes years to, uh, to codify. Uh, so depending on how that goes, and once we have everything in stone, then a reevaluating staffing needs is prudent. So with the timing of needing to get the ball moving on this and the unknown on the timing on the western portions, it seemed prudent to move forward for the best interest of the district to get the project going and then reevaluate when we have more concrete information. So to recap, um, in your opinion, it's an overall cost savings in term of long-term employment it may not be an overall cost savings in long-term employment, but with the uh, logistical needs to move the project forward and the unknowns and the timing on that, it seemed like it, it's a necessary step. Got it. And um, would you mind confirming these off-ramps exist and that you can be fired at any time for any reason? It's in your, it's in your general contract, yes. We don't like to use the word firing, but... Uh. <laughs> Just, I just want to say that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm but yeah, but yes, they're, they're they're it's it's a TNM contract, right? So uh, so they're working at our direction. So um, we direct them to proceed. We desi we we direct them to pull back. Appreciate the context and and thank you again for the presentation. And I would appreciate if you look into Director Boyd Hodgson's recommendation of grant uh, funding and alternative means of uh, re recouping these costs here. Good. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Then with that, I'd entertain a motion to uh, accept the uh, uh, professional service agreement. So moved. 
And a second? Second. Very good. Please vote. And passes unanimously. On to reports. General Manager's report. Yeah, I'll just keep it brief. Uh, so <coughs> two main items. First off, uh, our operations team has been stretched. The limit. I mentioned that the one of our new employees couldn't make it here due to uh, working until 5 a.m. Actually, the entire crew was out on two main breaks at the same time till, till roughly 5 a.m., I believe. But uh, we've experienced five main breaks in the last six days. Both. Uh, yeah, and uh, both Ed and I have talked briefly about it. Obviously, we had a very wet winter. Now we're having a very hot spell and a lot more water usage. This one may be part user error from a fire and fire department uh, basically shutting off the valves too fast. So our staff is reaching out to that fire department to go through training. Obviously, they're responding to an emergency. So, but it's still, it, their emergency may cause other emergencies for us. So we're trying to mitigate that as best as possible. We've worked with other fire departments in this, and it helps, but it oftentimes requires a refresher. Uh, second item is really a, the good news item is uh, Wes and his team, and through board prudent action and budgeting and rate setting and everything else that the board does and the team has followed through, we received our first AAA rating, oh. Fitch. So that's a, a huge accomplishment. Congratulations. Congratulations. So, uh, those, that uh, ends my uh, report. Very fine. District Legal Counsel. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Glenn asked me to report on the PFOS litigation settlements, which you've probably seen if you Google 3M. If that's probably the first 85 hits you'll get. Mm -hmm. um, on the t 22nd of June, uh, 3M announced that they had reached a potential settlement in pending uh, PFOS litigation. It's uh, part of a multi-district case that's pending in South Carolina. Uh, there are uh, thousands of pending cases against 3M and other chemical companies. They've been consolidated. Uh, this settlement uh, is a proposed settlement as part of a class action. It has to be approved by the court. Uh, According to 3M, it would fund up to about $12.5 billion um, to be paid out over the next 13 years. Uh, there are, if, it, if the settlement is approved, there would be a class qualification period. And in order to qualify, um, you ha would have to be an agency who has had to incur costs relative to PFOS testing, which everybody in California has and or found a result of that. Uh, and there are two different classes. One is people who have immediately dealt with that, or the second class is people who may incur those costs uh, prior to 2026. Um, as I said, it's one of a number, a series of these. There's another purported trail on, which is going to be the DuPont settlement. It's not as large, but it's about one8 billion dollars um, and this is a string of obviously PFOS litigation that has come out of uh, over the last five years uh, I, what's interesting about it is none of the litigation is both based on cancer or health risks it's all been based on its consumer based on uh, failure to disclose uh, breach of warranty uh, product defect type instances, so we haven't seen the next wave, which is likely going to be the, the health impacts. Um, and it has moved from the manufacturers to now the distributors of products, and at some point it's probably going to reach uh, the distributors of water, whose uh, water has been impacted by it. Um, this is closely related, I guess, to the EPA's actions earlier this spring. Uh, there promulgated uh, PFOS regulations for testing where we're going to have to report if we hit certain levels. Uh, if systems hit a s subsequent level, then they have to s shut down and, and mediate. But uh, um, those levels, what are they, James? I, like 5.1 per trillion, or per trillion, which, which is, uh, you know, we've, water agencies around the state are hitting response levels, uh, which have been really difficult 
from a testing standpoint, given that minute uh, particle content. Anyway. Is that concentration a new development? Or has that always been the, the minimum concentration? I think that, I don't know when that standard was, well, they were promulgated in like 2000 okay. on the PFOS level, so that's not new. Um, they, they, did, they did a clustering of it, the EPA did, to, to promulgate this regulation in March. Um, so that was a new approach, but um, you know, there's there's still big debate about the health impacts of this at what levels, blah blah blah. And we've all heard that before on other other things. So uh, we are we BBK are working in the process of issuing memos to our clients relative to what step what next steps they may take to uh, get involved in the litigation. Obviously, it would involve. Uh, appearing, I think you don't have to appear in the litigation, but you have to appear as part of the class. It's going to be essentially what they call an opt-out class, uh, where people will get notices. Uh, we've identified uh, several law firms, not us, that are, that are handling the class representation, so be, you'll get more money coming back to you than going to the lawyers. Uh, but of course, um, as lawyers are, there's a lot of them feeding and uh, we can't they can't solicit but they solicit um, and that that's a lot of that's going on now since the announcement of the settlement so more to come we'll work with uh, Glenn James and staff relative to Valacetus's position in that to, to and then come back to the board and probably give you our recommendation on what's the best pathway forward to get involved if, if we're in a position to qualify and just to add to that, Glenn wanted me to uh, also mention on the same subject matter that the member agency managers at this county water authority had a discussion on the PFOS information. There's a, a basically a public information group that's led by the water authority that Chris and his staff are members of. So they're, they want to get the messaging correctly. The good news, based on the reporting from the EPA, is that San Diego County isn't widely affected. It's groundwater sources that are more highly contaminated. The surface water, and we're really a surface water region, uh, isn't highly affected. It does not mean it's zero effect. It just means we're pretty low on that list. That's the good news. But the information is going to get out to the public, and, and misinformation also, or misconceptions may happen. So we want to get the messaging right. So we're pulling together resources. The Water Authority is going to centralize the message, and then each agency could kind of dovetail off the Water Authority's message. So that will be coming probably through P3 once we have that information, uh, depending on the timing, and then, of course, to the board as appropriate. Yeah, I, I should mention that the, 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 the culprit, in at least in this case, is firefighting foam. That, we, that was used to fight fires that then migrated into the water systems. Uh, the lead plaintiff in the case is a city in Florida, uh, which had concentrations of 1,600 parts per trillion. So, I mean, uh, so anyway. I, I do have a question. If, let's say, we are, let's say we get involved in the class action and there is money returned to the district, What's the legality of turning that back to the rate payers? My, yeah. Yeah, I, I would have, have to review the settlement constraints. I typically, I, I mean, I, what I've seen is that the money is intended to repay for basically, you're, you're, you're being forced to incur costs now that you weren't That's incurring right. prior for testing, et cetera. But I, there, there's probably not likely to be constraints in the settlement document itself other than the release you're going to sign. So, uh, again, it could be a reimbursement possibly okay. because it's cost you've incurred on behalf of the rate payers. But again, it's too early to know, but right now the only incurred cost that I'm aware of is just testing costs for us. And, and so if we're spending rate payer money to test, that comes back. So it, it basically goes back to rate payer because we get reimbursed. It's not a direct check to the rate payer, but it offsets that cost. I just did a Google search just to give us some idea of the magnitude. Uh, one part per trillion is one drop of water in 500,000 barrels of water. So uh, although this is very serious, uh, I, I don't think we need to stop drinking water. So, All right. Uh, County Water Authority, uh, 
Craig's not here, so we'll move on to Encina. Encina, we had uh, our capital committee this morning. Uh, a record meeting, less than eight minutes. <laughs> there, was, wow. there was no uh, report on capital improvements. Not, no milestones were reached. Uh, we are doing uh, energy resilient assessment, uh, hiring an outside uh, manager for that uh, because their EPA is uh, changing the regulations for emissions and our uh, cogeneration equipment out there is above that. So we're trying to figure that out. And, um, and that was the end of our meeting. Now let's see. Standing committees? Yes, the, uh, yes. The, the P3 committee met on July the 10th, and we talked about several things. I would like to remind everyone that Vallecitos is offering free, free landscape workshops to try to change out your plants for a more water-wise landscaping. They begin when? August the 2nd is the first one? Yeah, the first two match up with our board meetings the second. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> uh, but I was actually, I was walking the district telling people about this and, and knocking on some doors and, and people were really excited about it. So I hope that that generated some more interest. That is happening. It happens in a few weeks. It's a five-class program, and I believe if you attend all five, you get a visit from a landscape architect, which is a great bonus. Okay, we also talked about the employee handbook, how we are going to be reviewing that at the next P3, I'm sorry, I keep saying employee, yeah, the board member handbook. We're going to be uh, reviewing that at the next P3 committee. And finally, July 20th, which is tomorrow, is Take Your Kids to Work Day, which is always fun. Okay. That's it. All right. Very good. Um, uh, directors' reports on meeting conferences and seminars. Um, I attended the Kawa lunch about uh, the insane sewage spills that are happening in Tijuana right now and leaking into our ocean and closing Imperial Beach, um, Coronado including the Navy SEAL base uh, and dramatically affecting uh, the quality of life for people in southern San Diego. Uh, great guest speaker, uh, really passionate about this, uh, offered some concepts for solutions and how action is being taken today uh, for this uh, to be somewhat resolved in planning for the future. Um, I found it very uh, interesting and, and I'm glad that it is being seriously uh, considered at the state level um, and hopefully this brings awareness to the federal level and uh, uh, it seems like they were uh, very frustrated with that uh, presently but hopefully this uh, helps snowball that effort. So that's my summary of uh, that lunch which uh, was very informative. Yeah, we, so we all we all attended it, and, and it was. Uh, I, I also found it very informative. It was the former mayor of Imperial, Imperial Beach, Serge Dedina, that spoke, and you know one of the things that they have been working on, both in Imperial Beach with the the current mayor uh, Paloma Aguirre, as well as the county, is that they've been promoting a, a declaration of emergency down there on the Tijuana River, and there was frustration expressed in the lack of response at the federal level to, um, to, to try to solve this problem. But with the declaration of emergency, I specifically asked this question, is that thought that that will facilitate a response? And I think folks were optimistic that it would. And I hope it does too, because it's, it's making people sick. It's, um, it's, we're losing tourist dollars down there. And there, there are a lot of people whose lives depend on crossing through that region. And it's making a lot of people sick. I attended the meeting well, and I'll just ditto everything that was said. Uh, despicable. I don't know why uh, there isn't, a, a, as I say, a world EPA to so come and just step on them and get something done. Uh, but it's been going on for years. I didn't realize that. I, you know, you hear about it occasionally on the news, but it's almost <coughs> a daily occasion now. So hopefully something will be accomplished. <coughs> Item next is uh, meetings, uh, Water Education Foundation Eastern Sierra Water Tour. Um, I've been on this tour and also the Northern California tour. Um, I highly recommend our, our new board members take a look, see if this is a possibility. Great tour, great information, counterbalance between pros and cons of what's going on, but uh, you get a better idea of what the whole state is doing. 
Yeah, and if the board's interested, please let Ann know immediately because I believe they fill up really quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Awesome. Do we have any uh, comments or future agenda items to think about? I have a, I have a request. Yes. Um, you know, as I, I was walking in Lake San Marco, I was talking to folks about these landscaping um, workshops, and I, I visited a house of uh, a, a, a former uh, constituent. I knew the people that lived there before, and I met the new people that had moved in. They'd been there about a year, and they said, hey, do you know what's going on with Lake San Marcos? And I said, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I said, um, that is a very long conversation, and I, I know that Vallecitos is not solely responsible for parts of that cleanup, but I thought it would be really nice if we, as a board, had an educational, um, had somebody come speak from the parts, uh, the folks that are involved, because Lake San Marcos is turning over. You know, people are, people are moving out, new people are moving in, and they're wondering why they can't use the lake. And it's a, it's a long, it's, it's been in litigation for so long. I think having a primer on what is going on with Lake San Marcos, you know, how the water district is involved, because that's a question that I'm getting. You know, what, what are you doing about Lake San Marcos? Um, having a primer on that would be a fantastic agenda item if I could get someone to second that for me, please. Uh, I certainly will second that, as uh, this has been going on for as long as I've been on the board. We, there has been movement, there is a litigation that's being resolved, but uh, giving uh, an opportunity for someone to come give the primer to the other board members that haven't been on as long yeah, would can, probably be helpful. I, I can contact. The litigation has been settled. There's trust fund uh, implementation program. Balasitas obviously got out. Uh, Neil Myers, you may remember, had represented us. But I, I can work with Glenn and James um, and perhaps get, get a presentation that defines, you know, kind of the history of what happened, what the Perfect. fund is, and forward-looking into what they're doing. Thank you. Very so. good. So we'll, we'll go ahead and try and get that on the books. It may not be the next meeting, depending on the schedules, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll try and get that as soon as possible. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Uh, that may be. Uh, do we have any other comments from the board? No. Nope. Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.